Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags are taking on the Panthers of Georgia State on Thursday, widely considered one of the best number 16 seeds of all time. To hear more about this team and what the Zags need to do to avoid a cataclysmic loss, stick around all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another madness of the month of March. I want to thank all of you who are making this podcast your first listen every day. I know some of you have been listening for a very long time. Some of you are much newer listeners regardless. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to the show. And I appreciate those of you who have checked out the show on YouTube as well. We are just about at 400 subscribers, looking for 100 more people to hit that subscribe button between now and April 4th, when hopefully the Zags will be playing in the national championship game. So if you have not subscribed yet, go to youtube.com, search Locked On Zags, and hit that subscribe button. Zach's got a lot of games between now and that national championship game. The first one is coming up on Thursday, 1.15 p.m. Pacific time at the Moda Center in Portland, Oregon. They will be taking on number 16 seed Georgia State, the Panthers. We're going to talk all about them in the first segment. The Panthers were the automatic qualifier from the Sun Belt Conference. This is a team that has very frequently found themselves in the NCAA tournament. This is now their fourth bid. Since joining the, joining the conference, they only joined the conference in the 13-14 season. So they spent a lot of time in the NCAA tournament since then. Uh, they're most notably known for their upset against Baylor. They were a 14 seed upsetting number three seeded Baylor in that 13-14 season. So they've had they've done this before. They've played in the NCAA tournament. They're familiar with what this looks like, and they're familiar with pulling off an upset. They went 18 and 10 this year, nine and five. In conference play, they finished the season, according to Ken Palm, 151st in the country for reference. That is ahead of Portland, behind Santa Clara, of course, and Gonzaga and BYU and St. Mary's and San Francisco in the conference, but still a respectable spot for this team to be. They would be in the mid-level of the WCC, according to Ken Palm's rankings. Offensively adjusted offense, they are 201st in the country. Defensively, much better than that, 114th. And their tempo is 174th. Starting to see some similarities here. A okay defense, excuse me, okay offensive team, good defensive team, play at a pretty slow play, pace. Certainly not quite the level of a St. Mary's type team, but definitely probably going to get some vibes from that team in this game. Currently riding a 10 game winning streak. During that 10 game winning streak, they have been top 20 in the country defensively. They have locked it down on defense. That is part of the reason they are entering the tournament on such a hot streak. There are a lot of predictive models out there. One of them is at Heat Check College Basketball. Highly recommend checking out the 81 page NCAA tournament magazine that they released on. Tuesday, if you have not checked it out yet, is $8. Highly, highly recommend it. I know I retweeted it, so you can find it through my feed there. Uh, they talked about this team. They said it's the best 16 seed that they have ever seen in their models. Now, they haven't been around forever, but still, obviously, this is a dangerous 16 seeded team. It all starts on the defensive end of the floor. They have held opposing offenses to a 41.3% field goal percentage this season. That is really low. Now, it goes without saying that they have not played a lot of Gonzagas. This is a team that's in the Sun Belt Conference, didn't have a tremendously complicated non-conference schedule. So a lot of the teams that they have played are teams that are already not very good offensively. Still, to play 28 games and hold teams to barely over 40% from the field is obviously a really difficult challenge and something that this Panthers team proved capable of doing. They also force over 16 turnovers per game. That is remarkable. They are top 20 in the country in turnover rate. 
That means that they turn teams over more than basically everybody in the country, top 20 in the country. This is obviously going to be a huge part of this game. We'll talk about it more in the second segment. But if this team can come out and force a lot of turnovers, can limit Gonzaga's ability to get out in transition, you could see how they might stick around for longer than just the first couple of minutes. Now, there is a downside. There's a downside to Georgia State. They're a great defensive team, but the reason that they're not top 150 per Ken Palm, the reason that they still got stuck on the 16 seed line, they are not a good offensive team. Not just average, not just slightly below average. They are a bad offensive team. As a team, they shot 40.3% from the field. That is atrocious. There's no other way to put it. I have I don't, I don't want to be mean, but this is a bad offensive team. They, they do not get it done on that end of the floor. 44.7% on two-pointers. This is just about the worst two-point field goal percentage in the entire country. Not quite the worst, but one of the top five worst two-point field goal percentage in the country. And again, we talked about how they didn't play a lot of Gonzaga. So this is a team that shot under 45% on two-pointers, and they weren't facing shot blockers like Chet Holmgren or defensive players like Hunter Salas or even just guys as big and strong as Drew Timmy and Anton Watson. They shot 33% on threes, which isn't great, but is at least respectable, adequate. They're going to need to shoot well more than 33% from three if they want to pull off an upset in this one. The key players to look for for uh, for fans who are kind of wondering who's going to do the most damage for the Panthers, Corey Allen, is definitely their best player. Six foot two combo guard, 14 and a half points per game, three and a half boards, 3.2 assists. He's their outside shooter as well, 35 and a half percent from three. If they are going to stick in this game, they're going to need to have a better offensive performance than we've seen from them in a long time. That's going to start with Allen. He's going to need to come out, shoot 40 plus percent from three, drop 40, or excuse me, drop 20, 25 points for them to be able to stick around in this one. Then there's also Elil Sasume. Nine and a half points, just under 10 rebounds per game. Very, very good rebounding big man. One and a half blocks per game, shooting 55% from the field inside the three-point line. So a big dude, strong dude, good rebounder. I think he's going to be... He's going to be a solid, adequate big man for Chet Holmgren and Drew Timmy to match up against, but certainly, again, a, a player who is used to feasting on smaller, less less skilled big men in the Sun Belt Conference. All right, that is a quick and dirty primer on the Panthers of Georgia State. We're going to come back in the second segment, and we're going to dig a little bit more into this matchup. We're going to talk about my five keys to Thursday's games, the things the Zags need to do at their best or close to their best in order to ensure a victory on Thursday afternoon. Before we get there, though, let's talk about today's sponsor, Stat Hero. Stat Hero's NCAA single game pickums pits the star players against each other in an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. Take control back from those handicappers that always seem to have the advantage. Start focusing on the players you know best with a gameplay that doesn't rely on big spreads, long odds, or funky props. Stat Hero gives you the advantage, resulting in their gamers winning four times more often. Why? Because Stat Hero eliminates the mystery about who or what you are going up against. In addition to their pick'em games, they also have dozens of lineups you can comb through to take on head-to-head. They simply post sets of players for you to take on with a set of players you choose. Stat Hero is the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fix. The simple, sleek gameplay will have you playing in minutes. This is what daily fantasy was meant to be. Sign up for free right now at stathero.com slash locked on and use promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. That's stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% match. Today's episode is also sponsored by Built Bar. This is the time of the year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It actually feels like it's not really a resolution because I enjoy eating them. Have you tried the Puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. They have mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They are all delicious and new flavors are coming out all of the time. Go to Built.com 
promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked on Zags. Thank you again for making Locked on Zags your first listen every day. And make sure if you have not seen it already to check out the Locked on Bracket Breakdown right here on the Locked on Zags podcast feed and YouTube channel. The show is college basketball expert Chris Gordy, betting expert Lee Sterling, and myself. We each reveal our brackets and provide in-depth breakdowns on every matchup. So if you want to see what my bracket looks like, check out the Locked on Break bracket breakdown show on the Locked on Zags podcast feed. All right, five keys to the game. I've been doing these throughout the season. Instead of just focusing on things to watch, I'm talking specifically keys to the game, things Gonzaga needs to do in order to make sure that they walk away with a victory and a chance to play in the second round against either Boise State or Memphis, which is a game we will talk about in the third segment of this show. Before we get there, though, the number one key for this game, and I Teased it in the first segment. It's pretty simple. Take care of the basketball. Georgia State's best path to victory in this game is to wreak havoc on Gonzaga's guards early and often, force as many turnovers as possible, and prevent Gonzaga from getting out in transition. It's a tall order for them to do, but those are the things that is the recipe. We have seen teams do this to Gonzaga. Baylor obviously is the most notable example in last year's national championship game. You need tremendous amounts of athleticism in order to do that to Gonzaga. Georgia State probably does not have that. But we have seen teams like Tarleton State. We have seen teams like Merrimack. We've seen Alabama and Duke, who are obviously very good teams, but they gave Gonzaga fits in part because they were able to fluster Gonzaga's guards and force them into making turnovers. Gonzaga is elite at scoring in the half-court offense because of the big men Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren. If you don't let them get the basketball down around the basket, you have a much, much higher ability to win the game. Again, Panthers top 20 nationally in turnover rate. This is the thing that they are best at, is forcing the opposing team to turn over the basketball. That makes this a huge game for point guard Andrew Nembhard. He's up for the task. He likes big games. Remember what he did to UCLA. Remember what he did late in the season to St. Mary's and some other teams down the stretch. He played phenomenal basketball. He's going to need to be on his game. We need another performance where he's got eight, six, six, seven, eight assists, one or zero turnovers. If he does that, it is a guaranteed victory for the Zags. If he starts getting pressed and starts getting trapped and starts making bad passes, gets a little careless with the basketball, and it's not just him. Gonzaga's other guards could could fall victim to this as well. Chet Holmgren, Drew Timmy, and Anton Watson have had their issues with turnovers as well. They need to take care of the basketball, but it starts with Andrew Nembhard. If he has a good game, if he's in control in the the offense, if he runs the half-court offense, the pick and roll without turning the basketball over, this is going to be a much, much smoother game for the Zags. Next up, don't force outside shots. Georgia State's a good defensive team. They hold teams to under 45% shooting, but they also allow teams to shoot 37% from three. It could be tempting for Gonzaga to shoot a lot of threes in this game. They're probably going to be open because I suspect that Georgia State is going to give a lot of attention to Drew Timmy and Chet Holmgren wherever they are on the court. We're going to see a lot of double teams as soon as those guys touch the basketball because they don't have the size to hang with those guys one-on-one. Few people do, quite frankly. So I think we're going to see a lot of open opportunities for three. When these guys are open and it is later in the shot clock and they got a good look, fire away. I'm not saying that they should not be shooting threes at all in this game. I just don't want to see Gonzaga try to get complacent and shoot a lot of threes early in the shot clock, take the first good look that they get. If you're not getting out in transition and you're forced to settle for a half-court offense, that ball needs to funnel through Drew Timmy. It needs to funnel through Chet Holmgren. Gonzaga's pretty good about this. This isn't something that they have really struggled with all that much, but I could see Georgia State trying to implement a strategy that really forces Gonzaga to beat them from the perimeter. Coach Shante Leggins talked about this on my Tuesday episode of the podcast. As the coach of the Portland Pilots, he talked about how he – put in a strategy to make Gonzaga beat them from the outside. The Zags, of course, hit a program record 18 threes in that game. Shantae kind of shrugged his shoulders, said, hey, it was bad coaching. I disagreed with him. I do not think it was bad coaching. I think it was a the best strategy you could have implemented, and it did not work. 
If Gonzaga wins this game by knocking down 18 threes, great. There's nothing wrong with that. But my fear is that they will get too complacent shooting outside shots instead of trying their best to get the ball down low and get the better looks in the paint. Number three, I've teased this one already a handful of times, but the Zags, whenever possible, need to get out in transition. I suspect that the Panthers are going to make that as difficult as possible. This team is impossible to beat when they're getting out in transition on you with regularity. This is why St. Mary's basically did not attempt to get an offensive rebound against Gonzaga. San Francisco did something similar. There are a lot of teams that have tried this against the Zags. Shoot your shot and just run back. Does not matter whether there's a chance for an offensive rebound or not. You need to get back in defense. Do not let Gonzaga get out in transition. Georgia State has nothing to lose. This is going to be, they're going to press, they're going to trap, and they're going to get back in transition as much as possible because this is their best opportunity to win. For the Zags, you need to try to push it as much as you can. When it's not there, do not force it. And that's something that Gonzaga's guards are very good at. We see them attempt to get out in transition a lot, particularly against St. Mary's, and realize somewhat quickly, hey, it's not there, pull it back, set up the half-court offense, let's go from there. I suspect we're going to see a lot of that in this game as well because I think Georgia State is going to really try to take the transition game away from Gonzaga. But the Zags need to get out when they can. They need to set the pace as much as possible. It's a lot easier to slow a team down than it is to speed a team up. But whatever Gonzaga can do to get out and transition when there are long rebound opportunities to set the pace as much as possible is going to make things easier for them to secure a victory at the end of the game. Last two things, Monster Night from Chet Holmgren. This is gonna. This is a big game for Chet. It's the first NCAA tournament game. Yes, it's not against a super high-quality opponent, but a lot of people are going to be watching this game. A lot of people are going to tune in, not expecting a, a, a close game or an upset necessarily, but they want to see what's going on with that number 34 in a Gonzaga uniform, the tall, skinny kid from Minnesota. And I think he needs to step out and have a big game. He looked fatigued against St. Mary's the last time these, this team played. He was frustrated. You could see him kind of pulling on his hair uh, and, and showing some agitation. It was very uncharacteristic for him. I think there was some fatigue. I think he was just frustrated because he wasn't having a particularly good night, but he's gotten a, a break. Zags have been off for a while. I think he's going to come out, have a huge game. Gonzaga should really look to him early and often. Not that they don't already, but I think it's a good opportunity for him to, to really bury this team early by having himself a really nice night. And then the last thing, which kind of goes along with that, is bench production. We've talked about bench production a lot this season because it has been very spotty for the Zags at times. Recently, up until the last few games of the conference tournament, this bench production was a big problem for the Zags. They had a three-game stretch where they only had 10 combined points off the bench, seven of them coming from Hunter Salas in one game. Anton Watson was nowhere to be seen. Nolan Hickman was nowhere to be seen. This is offensively. Defensively, both those players as well as Hunter Salas, were, were contributing significantly on that end of the floor. I don't want to make it seem like they were not doing anything. They just were not contributing to this team in terms of putting the ball through the hoop. And that was a problem. Gonzaga should not have only five players scoring night in and night out. That's really tough, especially in a tournament setting where you turn around and play two days later. If Gonzaga can put this team away early, we could see six, seven, eight consecutive minutes of Hunter Salas at the end of the game. See seven or eight minutes of Anton Watson. Drew Timmy maybe only plays 25. Andrew Nembhard maybe only plays 26, 27 minutes. Obviously, these guys have not played in a long time, so there's an element of wanting to shake the rust off, but it also makes some sense for these guys to sit a little bit because they're going to play in just two more days, and they're going to play a good team, either Boise State or Memphis. It's going to be a challenge in that game, and that's actually what I want to talk to you about in the third segment. Boise State, Memphis, huge game, the first game on the slate for Thursday Winner of that game plays the winner of the Gonzaga-Georgia State game. Two very different teams with very different ideologies and strategies on how to win a basketball game. It's going to be a super fascinating game. We're going to preview those two teams in the third segment. Before we get there, though, let's talk about Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it is now impossible for your local chain's auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning? like is your Odyssey an LX or an EX, and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Plus, Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you could need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpets. 
I recently had my 13 year old car serviced. And I can tell you that having one place to find all the parts I need makes things infinitely easier. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in there, how did you hear about us box? So they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. That's rockauto.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still talking, talking March Madness, NCAA tournament, of course, Gonzaga versus Georgia State on Thursday. Winner of that game will play the winner of the 8-9 game between the Boise State Broncos and the Memphis Tigers. That's what I want to talk about in the third segment. Two very different teams. It's going to be a super fun matchup. Challenging second round game for the Zags. These are two pretty darn good teams to be on the 8-9 line. I think some people were a little upset that Gonzaga is going to have more of a challenge from that 8-9 game than, say, Seton Hall than TCU, which is another 8-9 matchup that certainly I would I would much rather have seen on this side of the bracket. We'll start with Boise State, the number eight seed. Boise State 27-7 and seven under Coach Leon Rice, of course, a familiar name to Gonzaga fans. He was an assistant, head, assistant coach at Gonzaga for a very long time before taking that job over at Boise State. Uh, they went 15-3 and three in conference play. They finished first in the regular season in the Mountain West and also won the Mountain West tournament. And I'm very surprised that th- this is a four-bid Mountain West. Boise State won outright a four-bid Mountain West conference and got an eight seed. That seems a little bit unfair to me. I think they probably deserved a higher seed. Uh, it is what it is. This is where they end up. Ken Palm had them finish the season 26th in the country. Uh, offensively, they were 76th. Defensively, they were 16th. This is a top 20 defense, borderline top 15 defense in the entire country. Tempo, 305th in the country. So once again, so we're talking about a team that's about basically top 75 offensively, well within the top 20 defensively, and plays at one of the slowest tempos in the league. This is basically a slightly, slightly worse version of St. Mary's. All the metrics are very, very similar. This is a good dangerous team. The pros, we're going to do pros and cons for each of these teams. They are elite defensively. Emmanuel Aka is a menace on the perimeter. He's an incredible defensive player on the perimeter. He's going to wreak havoc on any outside shooters. Uh, Armas and Kigab, great rebounders. They got they can clean the glass up. They got good perimeter defense. They hold opponents to just under 43% shooting on the season, only 32.5% from three. This is the biggest thing for Boise State for Coach Rice. He's always been an advocate for good defense. He's always had good defensive teams. This is the best defensive team that he has ever had. This team is also a good outside shooting team, 35% as a team. Not elite, but good enough to get it done. They also have a lot of clutchness on the team. Marcus Shaver, former University of Portland student who is now at Boise State, has hit multiple clutch shots this year. It seems like they're always down to the wire. They get it done in crunch time. It's one of those kind of difficult to measure, not necessarily tangible skills that they have, but I would think that playing in a lot of close games in the regular season would sure as heck help you in March. And they obviously, they won the the Mountain West Championship on a shot that rimmed out by San Diego State, another super close game there. So this is a team that has dealt with that kind of adversity and powered through it to get where they are today. Biggest cons for this team, they have two. The biggest one by far in my mind is their free throw shooting. They are an atrocious, horrendous free throw shooting team. As a team, they shoot 64.9%. That is 347th in the country. That is quite quite capital B bad for this team. They have a couple horrible, horrible free throw shooters. Their big man is shooting a 39% on the season from the free throw line. He also shoots more free throws than most players in the country, which is not super surprising because they're probably implementing a hack strategy there to get him to the line. The other big issue for Boise State is to turn the ball over quite a bit. Uh, That's obviously going to be an issue. You can have a good offense. You can have a great defense. But one of the hallmarks of Bennett's programs, in particular at St. Mary's, is the ability to take care of the basketball and avoid turnovers for Leon Rice. You can play great defense, and you can limit the other team to not very many possessions. But if you cough up the basketball, that's giving them more opportunities to score, and that causes a lot of problems. Moving on to the Memphis Tigers, Penny Hardaway's team went 21-10. and This season, 13-5 and five in the AAC. They finished third 
in the conference and then second in the conference tournament. They got blown out in the conference championship by Houston. Houston was 0-2 against them before that. It was the first team that Houston beat all season long that is in the NCAA tournament. Uh, for those of you making a bracket, looking at a number five seeded Houston team, worth pointing out, have not beat a single team in the NCAA tournament outside of Memphis. Just something to note there. Memphis, of course, very disappointing this season. They were in the news a lot, had really sky-high expectations, then ended up spending a lot of the season on the bubble, had a nice finish to the year, ended up safely in the field of 68 as a number nine seed. Ken Palm has them 28th. So again, Boise State 26th. Ken Palm, or Memphis, excuse me, 28th per Ken Palm. So obviously a very even matchup between these two teams offensively. Memphis is 50th defensively. They are 31st. So a top 50 team, both offensively and defensively. The biggest difference between these two teams, we talked about Boise State's tempo being outside of the top 300 teams. Memphis is 34th. These guys like to get out and go. This is a big running team. The pros for this team athleticism. This team is so dang athletic. They have so much talent on the roster. It's part of the reason Penny has been criticized so much this uh, this season because he has not handled adversity very well uh, in terms of his interactions with the press, which is generally going to get you criticism by the press when you don't do a good job and how you talk to them. But beyond that, you know, Amoni Bates has had a pretty terrible season for the expectations that were lauded on him coming into the season. Jalen Duran has been very, very good. Lester Quinones has been very, very good. But this team has kind of disappointed despite all of that athleticism. They're still a very efficient offense as well. 47.1% on the year, a field goal percentage. That is 38th in the country. They're shooting just under 36% from three, which ranks 62nd in the country. So they are a good shooting team. They, When they get shots up, they make them at a very, very high rate. They get out in transition a lot, which affords them more opportunities to put the ball through the hoop. Beyond that, they're also a very good rebounding team, 31st in the country in rebounds per game. And they're also excellent defensively. Very, very good defensively. They are fourth in the country in block rate. Fourth in the country as a team in block rate and 20th in steal rate. So they for, they get a ton of blocks. They get a ton of steals. They also force a lot of turnovers. This is a good all around top to bottom, very, very good defensive team who is also efficient offensively. The biggest con, the biggest con for this team is that they just don't get enough shots. And the reason for that is they have the highest turnover rate in the country. This is the issue. This is the issue for Memphis right here. They can play great defense. They can get a lot of block shots. They can get a lot of steals. They can force a lot of turnovers. They can shoot above average from three, above average from two, but they turn the ball over a bunch. Against a Boise State team that forces a lot of turnovers and plays a very slow pace, that is going to be a huge factor in this game. If Boise State can limit turnovers of their own, which is also a question mark, and play a slow, methodical pace, slow Memphis down, and make it so that they have to play at a slower pace, and Memphis cannot take care of the basketball, you're definitely going to be looking at a Mark Few-Leon Rice matchup in the second round. But if Memphis can get out, can get out in transition, can get go get going that way, can shoot from a high rate, and block a lot of shots, get a lot of steals, do the stuff that they do on the defensive end of the floor, they have better athletes than Boise State. They have more size. This is going to be a really interesting matchup. I, I'm not sure exactly. Every 8-9 should be a toss-up, in theory. If you feel really confident one way or another, there's probably a mistake in the seeding. I will say that I have Memphis advancing in this game. I would rather see Boise State, not just because of the Mark Few Leon Rice matchup, but because I think Boise State is going to be an a more winnable game for Gonzaga just because they're more familiar with them, with their style of play, uh, obviously with the coaching staff in that regard. Memphis is so unpredictable that it would be difficult for Gonzaga with less than 20, well, less than 48 hours to turn it around for them to figure out how to game plan against Memphis. They'd be better suited to game plan against Leon Rice and the Boise State Broncos, a team that, again, they may not have played them specifically very recently, but they have played a lot of teams like them this year already, and I think they'd be ready to go. Like I said, I'm taking Memphis. I'm going to be watching this game as closely as I can. It's probably going to be when I'm commuting out to Portland to go to the Gonzaga game. So I might not see all of it, but it's going to be a super interesting, fun matchup. One of the more fun matchups in the entire tournament, 
if I had to rank it, probably second or third most fun individual first round matchup behind probably Murray State and San Francisco, which is a game I'm super excited about seeing. Uh, but again, I would be I would be more excited about watching this game if I didn't have to think about <laughs> which, how this game is going to go when they end up playing Gonzaga in the second round, because I think both these teams could really give the Zags a pretty significant run for their money in the second round. All right, that is going to do it for me today. Look for a recap of both of these games tomorrow and a fun interview on Friday, all right here on the Locked on Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube as well. Another thank you to all of you who made Locked on Zags your first listen every day. Now is a great time to make your second listen of the day, the Locked on NFL Draft podcast. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever to get podcasts. All right. Thank you all for listening and go Zags.